Okay. Uh, before we continue, any questions from last time? Anything that was unclear or didn't make sense? Or, uh, And in case you are not on the uh, Slack work, uh, workspace for the course, uh, uh, after last class, Max pointed out that uh, sort of uh, there is a generalization of crafts inequality to a larger class of codes called uniquely decodable codes. So you can take a look at the discussion on the Slack workspace. Uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, if you have any questions from last lecture or anything we can discuss now or uh, in the office hours. Uh, Okay, so to recap, uh, we talked about the concept of joint entropy or the entropy when we are thinking of more than one random variables and how their entropies relate to each other. Um, in particular, we saw that for uh, <clears throat> two random variables x and y, we can write the entropy of x comma y as entropy of x plus something else, which is sort of an expected entropy of Y over various kinds of conditionings of X. And then we use this shorthand of H of Y given X. Uh, and this can be extended to more than two variables, uh, what we call uh, a chain rule. Uh, we saw that on average conditioning reduces entropy or rather H of Y given X is less than equal to H of Y. And this gave us an upper bound on the entropy of n variables called subadditivity. And then we use subadditivity to get some uh, simple applications like estimates for binomial sums or uh, a proof of the Cauchy Schwartz inequality or some other things. Okay. All right. Any questions? If not, then we'll proceed. But please stop me, just unmute yourself and ask. Or, uh, you can also ask in the chat, but I might be using this, if not always be able to see the chat. Okay. So mm, one thing I want to talk about today is, is sort of a generalization of subadditivity. And mm, just to say that, I mean, subadditivity, the idea was that we want to analyze uh, uh, the entropy of uh, x1 to xn and then in terms of just these kind of atoms or uh, just x1 or just x2 and so on. And this can be a good upper bound such as uh, in the case of uh, binomial sums, but um, uh, has two problems. One, uh, I mean, there's are really one problem, but uh, one, it, it might be too weak. Uh, in some cases, we might be able to say something about more than this kind of individual atoms x1 and x2, but maybe about x1 and x2 together or x1, x2, x3 together. Uh, and you might have n of them. So maybe we can say something about three tuples of variables. And the second, which is really a special case of uh, this issue is that uh, if you just reduce to uh, just x1 or just x2, the bound might become meaningless. Uh, in the sense that you might not have any interesting information about the atoms, so they might just be well, the only sort of interesting structure only starts to arise when you consider at least some small uh, local subsets uh, of uh, your n tuple of variables. And so, uh, Shearer's lemma, which was actually kind of a statement about hypergraphs uh, in, in terms of combinatorial statements, is really a way of generalizing subadditivity. Uh, um, to this kind of setup. Uh, and uh, so just as an example, let's see what is the kind of bound we can derive on H of X1, X2, and X3. Uh, if we, let's say, have some information about the pairs X1, X2, or X2, X3, but uh, not just about singletons. Okay. So uh, again, let's just um, try to apply our definition of joint entropy. So we can say that this is equal to H of
Yeah. So suppose we now have information about pairs, so we decompose into pairs. Another Okay, let's look at x2, x3. And then we will look at x1 given x2, x3. Okay, so we are expressing sort of some information about x1, x2, x3 now in terms of these kind of pairs instead of these individual atoms. So, except that we have two of the pairs, the third one is missing, but again, uh, it's the same sort of manipulation that we got in terms of uh, subadditivity that uh, conditioning reduces entropy on average. So we can drop conditioning and get an inequality. So in particular, let's say we add these two equations. And now we will place upper bounds on the remaining terms in a way to kind of form the h of x3, x1. So you can do it whichever way you want. Here we can say that this is less than equal to h of x1 because conditioning reduces entropy on average. And for this term, we can say this is less than equal to h of um, x3 given x1. Again, because at least we dropped some conditioning, not necessarily all of it. And then when you add it, you kind of get, get a nice um, conclusion, which is h of x1 plus h of x3 given x1, again, because of um, chain rule or the definition of joint entropy becomes uh, OK. So now compare this with uh, the the statement we had for subadditivity. And here, we're kind of getting a statement. Ah, for some reason, it's not visible. All right, let's try again. Okay. So We can get an upper bound on x1, x2, x3 in terms of entropy of pairs now. And uh, there might be cases in which we have more information about you know, these sort of pairs of random variables than just about the atoms x1, x2, and x3. Okay. Uh, a quick sanity check. Uh, if we call this inequality 2, and if we call this 1, then my claim is that Can someone tell me why? Someone will have to unmute and say. You can apply subadditivity on the right side. Great. Yeah. So uh, you can apply subadditivity in the right side. So h of x1, x2 is less than or equal to h of x1 plus h of x2, and everything will appear two times. So what we just derived is a a bound which is at least as strong as what subadditivity gives us, but there can be cases and we'll see examples in which case it can be better. Okay. And hmm, so it's clear why we are calling this a generalization of subadditivity. And let's see one application again. Now we'll again sort of think of a setting where we are trying to count points. Um, and I'll say so if, uh, why you can think of points as sort of convex bodies or like in general bodies and so on. But uh, let's start with an example. Let's say we have uh, points in three dimensions and uh, we don't quite have the knowledge of how many points we have, but we understand a little bit about their two dimensional projections. Okay. So let's say uh, you have a set of points in 3D. If I project them, to the x, y plane, I get uh, n1 points, uh, so n1 distinct projections. So if I project them to the uh, y, z plane, let's say, I get uh, n2 points. And if I project them to the x, z plane, I get n3 points. Okay. And now the question is, 
can we provide as a bound on the set of points uh, on the size of the set of points in terms of these projection sizes uh, okay. is the question clear yeah just stop me if, if something is not clear okay and one bound which we can provide of course is that uh, if i tell you sort of the projection of a point in each of these three planes x y projection y z projection and z x projection then uh, you will know the x y and z coordinate of the plane and uh, of the point so you can uniquely identify a point so uh, each three tuple of the projections uniquely identifies a point or another way of saying that is the number of points is no more than the total number of the total numbers of three tuples of projections you can have okay. but uh based on uh what we just saw in terms of generalizing subadditivity i claim we can do a little better uh well okay maybe significantly better in this case and the idea which again so this is usual in uh, trying to apply entropy arguments for combinatorial uh, problems and counting is that we will set up a random variable uh uh which is uniform over um, the objects or the, the set of combinatorial objects that we are trying to count so let's say x y z is um, are the three uh, coordinates of uh, a uniformly chosen point in our set s so now because this tuple uh, is uniform over our set s we know its entropy we know the entropy is just kind of log of the size of the set over which it's uniformly distributed and the point is we'll try to get a bound uh, using uh, so sort of shearer's lemma like argument or a generalization of subadditivity so uh, based on what we just saw we can say that 2 times h of x y and z is less than equal to h of x y plus h of y z plus h of z comma x okay and we can get some bounds on each of these terms so in particular xy is it's not necessarily uniform but it's distributed among the set of projections on the xy plane we don't quite know what its distribution is but its distribution but its entropy at most can be what it would be if this was the distribution was uniform among all projections on the xy plane so the entropy is at most uh log of the size of s1 which is nothing but log of n1 similarly this is less than equal to log of n2 and this is equal to log less than equal to log of n2 and combining the inequalities we get uh, that two times log of s is less than equal to log of n1 plus log of n2 plus log of n3 uh which just means that size of s is less than equal to square root of n1 n2 and n3 so It, the bound is quadratically better than what we just got by sort of uh, saying that if you know all three projections you know the points and this is actually more general so instead of points we could have had an arbitrary sort of uh, body in uh, b in uh, three dimensions uh, and let's say its projections to the x y y z and uh 
Z explains uh, are B1, B2, and B3. And you can think of this body as being kind of divided into very tiny uh, atoms. You can uh, divide it into very small cells. Each of them you can think of as a point. And so number of points is just uh, uh, a substitute for the volume of this uh, body. The number of points will be, I mean, yeah, this is maybe skipping over a lot of analysis, but roughly you can think of it as measuring the volume. And so this inequality can also be interpreted as saying uh, the volume of this body is less than or equal to the, now the area uh, or the square root of the area of B1 times area of B2 times area. Or more generally, if you have a body uh, in D dimensions, then you can look at its uh, D minus one dimensional projections. And uh, now instead of area, you will write whatever is the notion of volume in this D, mi D minus one dimensional space. So it will be the D minus one and D dimensional volumes. And the power now will be one over D minus one rather than uh, one over two. Okay. And this is something called the Loomis-Whitney inequality. Uh, and yeah, the proof up to this sort of issue of approximating bodies by a lot of points uh, is just uh, this generalization of subadditivity that we saw as Schrader's lemma. So uh, there are some applications to counting problems. And more generally, let me state the version of Shearer's lemma have been kind of um, uh, using implicitly, and then, then uh, we, will, we will go to a proof. But uh, this, I mean, Shearer's lemma originally was stated in terms of hypergraphs and some combinatorial counts. The version, uh, I mean, it, it's called an entropy lemma, but the proof I'm going to give is uh, kind of a folklore proof due to Radhakrishnan, I think now also written in his survey, which is referenced on the course web page. Uh, and also appears in this paper of Freegood that uh, I referred to last time. And it's, so last time we, like or previously we said, we have n random variables. Suppose instead of having information about um, single random variables, we have information about two tuples, about x1, x2, x2, x3. Can we get some bound on the joint entropy of x1 to xn in terms of this entropy of these two tuples? More generally, uh, suppose we have subsets uh, of uh, n. So this s could be the, the set 1, 2, or 2, 3, or could be slightly bigger. Okay. And let's say we have some information about uh, a bunch of subsets. So, and I'm just using this x sub s is just a shorthand for all the xi's for i in s. Okay. So uh, this is just notation. So in particular, um, x1, comma 2 is just a shorthand for x1, comma x2, and so on. So this is just notational. It will be slightly convenient to write things this way in the proof. And Suppose we want to understand the entropy of X1 to Xn together or the joint entropy in terms of whatever is this collection of subsets where we do have some interesting things to say maybe. So uh, X sub S, um, uh, so we have some collection uh, script F of, of subsets uh, about which we can say something interesting. And the goal is if we understand the entropy of all subsets in script F, can we say something about the entropy of the entire collection of X1 to Xn together? And earlier we saw that if you look at all two tuples, then uh, for all the variables, if you have three variables, each of them appears, or in general, each of them appears at least two times if you're considering the set of all two tuples. And so you can say that two times H of X1, X2, X3 is, um, is, is less than equal to the summation over all two tuples. 
and more generally, if you have uh, a collection of subsets, each xi appears at least t times, then you can say that t times the entropy of um, uh, x1 to xn is upper bounded by kind of this uh, sum over all subsets in your family uh, x of s. Okay. And again, as before, uh, check that this version implies subadditivity. It's the same proof. So I'm just giving it away, but um, it's good to just verify. Uh, there is a slightly sort of fancier version, which uh, again, is, is not too much more complicated. So <clears throat> instead of saying that uh, I have a collection of subsets, let's say I have a distribution over subsets. Um, so two to the n is just uh, a fancy notation for the power set of n or uh, the collection of all subsets. So instead of saying I have a distribution over subs, uh, instead of saying I have a collection of subsets, I'm just saying I have a distribution over subsets. And now, instead of saying that in this collection, every i appears t times, I'm saying over this distribution, every i appears with probability at least mu. And then the bound is of the sort of same type that uh, uh, if instead of uh, uniformly, uh, so if instead of adding entropy for all subsets in this collection script f, I'm just taking the expected uh, entropy of uh, x of s, where s comes from this distribution. Uh, and uh, I'm saying this upper bounds um, h of x1 to xn up to this mu. Again, my claim is that the second version implies uh, the first one. So maybe it's obvious. If not, yeah, it's good to just sort of uh, check to translate. Um, and we'll come back to it, but uh, mm, uh, before we kind of get to proving it, let's just understand, uh, just get a little comfortable excuse, with this notation uh, X of S or H of X of S. So uh, let me write it out uh, and, and just set up some notation which will be useful in the proof. So remember, uh, h of x of s is just a fancy notation for h of, uh, in this case, uh, let's say s was i1, i2, i3, and let's say these are in increasing order. Okay. Mm. And of course, by chain rule, we can write them as xi1, uh, um, Madur, like yeah. we, uh, I, I can't see what you're writing. Oh, sorry, sorry. I forgot to flip the page. So far, I just wrote the chain rule. Okay. All right, and now I'll write it slightly more succinctly, which will be useful in the proof. So in general, for uh, any set S, I claim what we have is um, you look at the elements uh, that appear in S, you write their entropy conditioned on whatever comes before them in the set. So and this can be written in a slightly uh, of compact way where 
remember we have already been using this notation n for the set 1 to n already used it in defining the power set and so on so i can write it in a slightly compact way as saying entropy of x sub i conditioned on s intersect all the elements before i. Right? So whatever is in s and comes before i. Okay. That's just an equality. It's just a notation, but this will be convenient in proving uh, the version of Shearer's sample. Any questions about just uh, how we are writing this? Okay. So now let's prove uh, this uh, version of Shearer's lemma, which is in terms of these distributions. Uh, and yeah, this is just a statement written again. Uh, we'll, we'll see the proof in a minute. But really, it's uh, nothing beyond uh, subadditivity and then sort of conditioning applied uh, just uh, in a slightly careful sequence. So let's start with the right hand side. So we talk, sample a random S from this distribution and we look at H of X of S. By what we just saw, sorry. this can be written as uh, X sub i conditioned on whatever came before it. Okay. And we want to sort of uh, connect it to the entropy of X1 to Xn. When you write X1 to Xn out, it's just sort of X i conditioned on one to i minus one, not just sort of uh, uh, conditioned on S, but on everything. So, and, and, the inequality is in the right direction. So we can just do that. Let's say so instead of conditioning on S intersect I and S1, we are considering a sort of conditioning on everything. This almost looks like, uh, so basically the left-hand side of the inequality we want to prove has no dependence on S. So we are trying to get rid of S. Um, and this sort of almost is there. We got rid of uh, one occurrence, um, uh, uh, one occurrence of S. And now uh, we want to get rid of, I mean, we don't want to get rid of it for free. We want to gain this mu in the process. So let's do that. Um, But the way we will do it is just instead of summing over S, let's sum over everything. Okay. So let me write this in red just to highlight what changed. And then let's just kind of put an indicator of um, whether the I we are looking at is an S or not times um, okay so again just a rewriting we're just summing over everything but then we are adding a one zero variable which will pick out when things are in s and just be zero otherwise but now with this uh, we can just exchange the summation and uh, the expectation uh, which makes things uh, very convenient so uh, mm. So we can push the expectation inside. Um, and the second term doesn't depend on uh,
And this is just the probability that uh, of this particular I occurs inside uh, a random S. We know by assumption that this is at least mu. So we just get that this is greater than or equal to mu times summation over I in N H of Xi which is just mu times h of x1 to okay. x So yeah, the proof is not complicated. It's just uh, sort of a careful application of conditioning uh, uh, the right time. But the lemma itself is, is quite powerful. Um, in particular, it lets us analyze uh, uh, the entropy in terms of whatever uh, X sub S, we seem to have some information about. And let me, I'll show you one more example, and then we'll move on to another concept. But any questions about the proof? Uh, okay. If not, let me show you sort of uh, one more example, which again is motivated by combinatorics, um, but it sort of really illustrates why maybe thinking of uh, subsets of size one might just be sometimes meaningless and we need to apply something more interesting. Okay, so the question is to count, let's say copies of uh, a small graph G inside a big graph H. And what does it mean to say there is a copy of G inside H? Uh, well, there is a mapping which kind of maps every vertex of G to some vertex of H, there's lots of room inside H, so potentially there could be many mappings, but think of the size of G as five, and this is the example we'll consider in a minute anyway. So just these five vertices, you just need to tell me where the first one maps, where the second one maps and so on. And this should be a copy in the sense, whenever there is an edge in G, it should map to an edge in H. All right, and a lot of the time, so if, uh, in many applications in combinatorics, there is interest in understanding how many ways can we kind of embed G inside H. And again, this is a very generic uh, sort of uh, setting. More generally, what you are interested in is finding copies of some kind of one object inside a bigger object while respecting some sort of local structure. Here, the local structure happens to be edges, but there is some sort of tiny structure inside uh, G that you want to respect. And then you want to just kind of embed it inside a much bigger data set. And graphs and edges are just one sort of convenient example of object for embedding in local structure. Okay, any questions about the problem definition? Okay, so uh, let's say we just kind of consider G as um, the five cycle. Okay. And let's say let's call these vertices one, two, three, four, and five. So among all the set of va all valid embeddings or home, what are called homomorphisms, uh, pick a random homomorphism. And let's just call it, uh, uh, let's just denote it by this random variable f, which can be specified by just saying where every vertex of G goes. So where does the first vertex go? Uh, so this will be uh, some element of the vertex set of H the power five, it will be some five tuple of vertices inside H. Okay. And uh, now again, we want to, so if, uh, as before say that H of F uh, is equal to log the size of a set of homomorphisms. And 
again, we want to upper bound uh, the entropy of um, F. And we will use pretty much the same uh, argument we used before, but I just want to point out that uh, here, the edges of H are what really determine whether even one embedding is possible or not. Uh, vertices of H uh, have no information. If H was completely empty, there were no edges in H, then no embedding would be possible. If H is like the graph with all possible edges, then lots of embeddings are possible. The vertex set remained exactly the same. It's really the edges which kind of make sure that I have enough local patterns to kind of copy over G or not. So uh, edges uh, kind of uh, only appear when I look at the behavior of two, at least two vertices from the cycle. So when I look at F1 and F2 together, if I was just looking at where, what F1 is or where the first vertex goes, it only gives me information about vertices which is kind of meaningless in this setting. It's only when I start looking at edges that I do get information. So in particular, let's assume that uh, H has some M edges. And as before, we can say that uh, two times um, H of F uh, is, uh, is less than equal to H of uh, F1, F2 plus H of F2, F3. It's a total of five terms, one for every edge of the cycle. So total five terms. And now we know that each edge of the cycle must map to an edge inside H. That's kind of the problem definition. So the number of choices for F1, F2, uh, is at most M or rather, I mean, 2M because it's ordered. So uh, we can kind of pick an edge in any order. So, and so the, the entropy itself uh, is less than equal to log of 2M. And so again, it's pretty much the same uh, bound we had from counting points. We will get that, uh, uh, the number of homomorphisms is less than equal to 2m to the 5 over 2, which in this case is, is a tight bound up to the constant in front. In terms of m, it's the tight bound. And in general, this method can actually always give the tight bound on counting graph homomorphisms. And uh, there is kind of a more general result of Noga Elon uh, later proved by Frigut and Khan, which I've kind of split into pieces and, and sort of included as a, an extra problem in the homework, which you don't need to submit it, but it's fun trying it out. In general, it depends on the solution to kind of a small linear program on G called the fractional independent set number. Uh, and, uh, fractional color. okay, but uh, yeah, whatever it is, it's a solution to that linear program. And uh, you can always kind of, uh, give a tight bound using just some applications of Shearer's lemma. So uh, yeah, you can take a look at the homework problem. I'll release it on Thursday. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to point out that this is an example where we really need to look at pairs because vertices have no information in terms of local patterns. Right. Any questions? Hey, Madhu, yeah. so this number is right. I, this number increases with the number of edges in this uh, small G graph. So. This I mean, because it's uh, it's raised to the power of um, number of yeah. edges by two, right? Uh, yeah, so, in this case, it's number of edges by two, yes. But in general, it will be something which, a parameter which depends on G, but not always edges by two, but yeah. So is it counterintuitive that big, because a bigger graph might have uh, more edges? And I would think that finding this bigger graph inside uh, F would be more difficult as I add more edges. Ah, right, good. So it, it's a little bit of a balance. So uh, in some sense, it's a bigger graph, but at the same time, it's a question of uh, how much uh, restriction does every edge coming inside this G uh, put uh, on you in terms of finding embeddings, okay? Like, let's say we had no restrictions. I just wanted to find a copy of a vertex in H. If H had N vertices, I would have N ways of doing this. If I wanted to find a copy of two vertices, it would be N square. 
because just putting an additional vertex actually increases my choices and puts no restriction. And in general, it's a question of when you are uh, considering a larger G, uh, you are increasing the number of vertices, potentially the number of edges, but maybe you're also increasing. So that gives you more freedom. You can have copies in more ways. You have more choices for the vertices, but then maybe these edges are interconnected in some weird way, which means that you have more restrictions. So right. it's, it's, it's a trade-off between these two. And so, yes, it, it can be true that if H was a fairly large clique, then I might have uh, essentially no choices in terms of embedding it. Um, but if it's a cycle, there are very few edges inside G, so I have more choices. And yeah, in general, yeah, you'll see that this kind of linear program makes these trade-off between both of these options, uh, how the vertices grow, how the edges are interconnected and choices reduce. Right. So that's why I was wondering maybe with even higher terms of this uh, entropy function as in uh, one, five huh. and two, or uh, you could, you would get my more tighter bounds. Right. Right. Okay. Great. Uh, so in terms of, for this problem, it, it uh, uh, turns out it doesn't matter, but that's, I think also partly cheating because uh, it's coming from the fact that the only information I'm giving you about H itself is that it has M edges. So in some sense, the relevant information is about two tuples. So I see. if I also told you that in addition, uh, H has like um, M prime triangles or it has certain number of four cycles or, so then it's very likely that uh, kind of using higher terms in this entropy will give you better bounds. It's just that, this particular formulation of the problem when only thing I've told you about H is edges is when two tuples give a tight bound. So it's really yeah, a little bit of cheating there, but. Got it, yeah, thanks. Okay, any other questions? All right, so let's move on to our next uh, kind of information theoretic quantity that we will uh, look at maybe for this lecture and part of next, um, which is called mutual information. and. Uh, I mean, really speaking, we've already seen this. Uh, uh, so last time we talked about how conditioning on average reduces entropy and excuse me, how much it reduces entropy can be used as a, as a way of measuring uh, sort of how dependent two variables are. And in particular, we saw that when they are independent, uh, uh, H of X given Y is equal to H of X. It's an if and only if, so uh, it doesn't reduce entropy at all. And in general, this is captured by something called mutual information, which is just how much entropy is reduced. So H of X uh, uh, minus H of X given Y. Written this way, this definition is kind of not satisfactory because somehow H uh, or, or Y, depending on what you like more, has a slightly different status than the other one. It's, uh, it's a, it looks asymmetric in terms of X and Y, but that's actually easily remedied. Uh, you can, uh, you can add H of Y and subtract H of Y. And so this is nothing but H of X comma Y. And so then it looks uh, a bit more uh, symmetric. And because it's symmetric, we know that uh, we could have exchanged the rows of X and uh, Y. So we can also write this quantity as uh, how much does conditioning on uh, X reduce the entropy of Y. Okay. So really these are just uh, equalities. You can pick whatever definition is more convenient to work with in a given application or you find more convenient to think about. But I'll emphasize that this is again a way of measuring how much information or how much dependence there is between X and Y. And we saw that when they're independent, this is zero. Uh, but more interestingly, it's, it's a way of kind of measuring some form of correlation between the two. And again, this is by no means unique as with entropy. There are many different ways of uh, sort of measuring dependence between random variables. Uh, a commonly used one is covariance, but somehow the drawback of covariance sometimes is that it's a good measure for comparing like apples and apples. So it's a 
maybe the expectation of uh, x times y minus expectation of x minus expectation of y divided by some things, but it makes sense when you can multiply x and y. Uh, or if they are vectors, you can take their inner product or something. But if uh, x yeah, is, is, a, uh, is a set of functions and uh, y is a set of inputs um, or y is a set of uh, faces of a dice, I mean, uh, 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 so then it doesn't quite make sense. And some of mutual information is makes sense uh, even when x and y are kind of very different type of objects. Okay. I mean, this quantity also has its own drawbacks, but uh, let's start with the benefits. At least let me try to sell it to you, but uh, uh, we'll go from there. And just like before, uh, just like in the case of entropy, we can define a conditional notion of uh, uh, mutual information, which is the h of x uh, uh, and or like the mutual information between x and y given z, which is again a shorthand. When we said h of x given z, this was a shorthand for expectation over all values of z. And when we considered the random variable x given a, a fixed value for capital Z. Here, you do this to both uh, uh, x and y simultaneously. So let's just also develop this expression a little bit. Um, we can write it again in terms of entropy. So let's write as h of x given z equals z. This is just using the definition. X given a fixed value of Z is an actual random variable. So I can just apply the definition of mutual entropy for random, random variables or mutual information, sorry. Uh, so And that's nothing but uh, H of X given Z minus h of x uh, given y. So again, it sort of behaves as if like this conditioning on z or our x conditioned on z was an actual random variable and then we get the same definition. Okay. So that's just the expression for uh, mutual information. Any questions about the definition? Okay. So first, sanity check. Uh, what is the range of this quantity? What um, uh, bounds does it live between? Um, and we already saw that uh, this is always greater than or equal to zero because uh, uh, remember it's uh, how much did entropy reduce by conditioning on Y? And it never goes up. So it sort of must reduce at least by some uh, amount or uh, at least at sort of worst it will stay the same. And uh, again, going back to this expression, it's h of x minus something non-negative. So the, at most what it can be is um, uh, h of x um, or h of y. I mean, uh, uh, Let me just write, um, uh, actually it's just minimum, minimum of uh, h of x, h of y. But let me write it in terms of h of x just for now. And uh, this quantity, I mean, is interesting to study when x and y are given to you, but um, it becomes even more interesting when there is some freedom in choosing y and we want to understand how it behaves. So just going back to the definition and think of thinking of it uh, in this lens of uh, choosing y, we can choose to minimize the mutual information, which is when we choose uh, uh, mm, y which is independent of x. So. And here we get this if we choose y, which is as dependent on x as possible or y is equal to x. But there are a lot of settings where we can't just choose y arbitrarily, but they have some constraints coming from the problem. And uh, so it's a lot more interesting question to study what is the mutual information or what is the best y we can choose under certain constraints. And these constraints, again, depending on your application, it could be that uh, uh, x is something that is coming out of uh, 
uh, uh, some transmission channel on which you are sending some uh, bits and there is some amount of noise. And so you want to choose um, uh, Y so that uh, there is maximum amount of uh, mutual information between X and Y or uh, this is uh, uh, sort of the setting of error correcting codes or in particular channel coding. Uh, uh, X could be some sort of uh, uh, data that you are getting and uh, uh, or rather actually a property of uh, the data that you want to understand and why could be a statistical estimator. And uh, uh, it could be some sort of neural network, which is, I guess, uh, some popular application these days, but uh, you want to say that your output of neural network, maybe wants, you want it to learn a lot about some underlying structure, but at the same time, you don't want it to overfit and you want to kind of, don't want it to learn much about uh, some sort of raw data samples. So. Somehow, so it's something it should have high mutual information with something it should have low mutual information. It could be a communication protocol when you're sort of two parties are given two different inputs and they're trying to talk to each other and uh, learn and try to compute a function of these two inputs. So you want them to communicate as little as possible uh, and reveal as little as possible about their input beyond what is absolutely necessary for communicating the function. So it's a way of measuring how effective communication protocols are, or again, also, the limits on communication protocols. It could be the memory content of an algorithm, which is kind of like your sort of data is going by in a data stream. You're just collecting some information about it, which is kept in some limited amount of memory, or maybe on a router. And you want to understand uh, uh, how, what is the kind of uh, mutual information or what does this memory content tell you about the data that has gone by and how much does it convey to you when you combine it with the data that comes next. So. In each of these settings, it's kind of we used both for proving kind of fundamental limits on what can be done and also for choosing uh, why in, in a good way. And then the mutual information can be used as a sort of a guiding principle for both of them. Okay. And we'll see some examples uh, later, but just I wanted to illustrate that the same quantity can appear in many different names in many different settings. Okay. All right. Before we go there, let's at least just calculate uh, mutual information for the toy example. So let's say X, Y, and Z are three zero one variables. And I mean, I'll let you in on the secret. I've chosen them so that the sum is always zero mod two. So uh, there's always an even number of ones uh, in, the, in the string that I've chosen. And now my question is, what is the mutual information of X and Y? And what is the mutual information of X and Y conditioned on Z? Like last time, I'll ask you to calculate and then uh, unmute yourself. Someone say the answer. We'll maybe yeah wait a little bit before we proceed. But uh, it might be useful to do this calculation. All right, any takers for the mutual information of X and Y? Zero. Okay, zero, why? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think it's one, H of X is one and then H of X given Y is also one. So one minus one. Let's see. So h of x uh, is one because uh, x appears to be uh, zero or one each with probability half uh, each. So h of x is one, okay. And uh, you're claiming that h of uh, x given y, uh, which is really so for the probability that y is equal to zero, which happens with probability half, um, uh, h of x given y is equal to zero plus, which is an average of these two things. And in particular, if we consider y is equal to zero, uh, then we have these two choices. Um, and x is still zero or one with probability half. Um, and similarly, when y is equal to one, right? Um, 
I guess this is the computation you were doing. So yeah, so this is also equal to and h of x was also one. So the mutual information of x and y, uh, another way to see this is um, if you kind of just blocked out the third column, um, then uh, x and y is the uniform distribution on uh, uh, two bits and uh, it's as if they were distributed independently. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. And what is the mutual information of x and y uh, given z? So again, this is an average, I mean, yeah, you can compute it in multiple ways. You can fix z and then compute uh, mutual information of x given a value of z. You can compute it based on the conditional entropies we wrote down, whichever is uh, uh, easier. So, Is it one? <laughs> um, why do you say that? I, I have not calculated, but I'm just guessing. <laughs> okay. Uh, Can I propose two? Ah, okay. So I got another taker, which is zero. Okay. So we have zero, we have one, something else. Two, maybe. Sorry? Two. Two? Okay. Uh, I'll put in a vote for one. No word for one. Okay, so we have two words for one. I also think one. Uh, okay, one more. All right, one seems to be popular. Uh, okay, so one is the right answer in this case, and uh, let's see why. I mean, again, as I said, you can calculate it in multiple ways, and let's try uh, maybe both of them, um, or at least two that I can think of. But <clears throat> so. Uh, Mm. First, I mean, let's at least also kind of intuitively think uh, why this is the case. So uh, h of x, uh, sort of the mutual information between x and y given z. So if you fix a value of z, then if you look at this equation, if you plug in a value of y, the value of x is kind of fixed. So it at least says that it should not be maybe zero, so you might not have complete independence. Uh, if you plug in a value of uh, y, the value of z is already sort of, although kind of given z, we need to take with a little more care, but so this is just an intuition, it's not a proof, but let's actually do the calculation. Okay, so let's first <clears throat> kind of calculate it in terms of h of, um, uh, let's say x given z minus h of, um, x given y comma z. Okay, this quantity we have already computed. Uh, we computed h of x given y, but all three variables are symmetric here actually. So it doesn't matter. It's um, h of x given z will behave the same way and it's one. Uh, mm. Right, and now h of x given y comma z now this, we can actually kind of formalize the intuition, but uh, if you fix a value for y and z, then the value for x is fixed. So in particular, if you fix uh, y and uh, z to be zero, uh, then we are here and x is kind of fixed uh, uh, to zero also when y and z are both fixed to zero. You can check that this is true for any values that you can assign to y and z. So, every fixing of y and z fixes x, so the entropy here is actually just zero. And uh, so the mutual information is, uh, is equal to one. You can also check it with the other definition, which is um, uh, the mutual information between x given z is equal to z and uh, y given z is equal to z uh, in expectation over 
z, which will be zero or one with probability half. Okay, maybe let me skip that for now, but let me emphasize an interesting point. Um, one, okay, the, the, the kind of lower bound of zero and the upper bound of one came from the upper and lower bounds on entropy that we know from mutual, for mutual information. Uh, the second, unlike uh, uh, entropy, where we know that on average it decreases on conditioning, this doesn't seem to be the case for mutual information. We started with zero and it actually grew. It increased on conditioning. Okay. And uh, the reason is that uh, the kind of these two players in the game and um, both of these uh, terms can potentially decrease on conditioning. If we look at just H of X minus H of X given Y and uh, H of X given Z minus H of uh, X given Y comma Z. And uh, so the, whether the mutual information increases, decreases, remains the same kind of depends on the balance of how these two terms are affected by conditioning. And uh, so Unlike entropy, this doesn't always decrease. Uh, and this is an example where it really started with zero and actually increased to the maximum possible. Okay. All right. Uh, let me go ahead from this example. So the next is an exercise, but I encourage you to kind of try it. It's, a, a, as we said before, uh, just like entropy is sort of useful in saying when I'm trying to send some information to you, uh, what is the best way of sending it or what is the minimum number of bits I can use to send it. Um, similarly, uh, or, or what is the absolute bare minimum number of bits I might need uh, to send it depending on how you want to do it. Similarly, mutual information can be viewed as saying that if I'm trying to send some information to you, but there is some sort of a uh, noise uh, that is happening. So maybe what I send doesn't get through properly. And uh, mutual information kind of is a way of giving fundamental limits on how well I can communicate in this setting, which is known as Shannon's uh, channel coding theorem. I'm not giving the theorem yet, but I'll ask you to sort of just calculate this toy example. So suppose I'm trying to send you X uh, and the, the channel or sort of the medium I'm using to communicate has a very kind of simple way of uh, sort of with, that with probability one minus P, it sends you what I sent. And with probability P, it sends you the opposite of what I sent. The question is, what is the mutual information between what I sent and what you received? It's called the binary symmetric channel. You can also think of how the mutual information varies if X is not uniform, but something else. It's a good exercise to try. The second, which is just an observation again, is that uh, you can also prove a chain rule on mutual information. This is uh, pretty much the same as the chain rule for entropy. In fact, it's um, just apply, sort of obtained by applying the chain rule on each of the two terms. So we can see, uh, mm, let's see how I want to prove it. Okay, yeah. So, mm, so the mutual information can be viewed as um, uh, And uh, I can apply a, a chain rule to each of them. Um, and then just combine again. Okay. So uh, this is just how to compute the mutual information when you have a tuple of variables. So, um, Note that we can't quite say 
subadditivity, we can't drop the conditioning in these terms because of the previous example. So it doesn't always, uh, uh, in fact, there are some examples where it's super additive and so on. So it's, uh, you have to be a bit careful, but you can write the chain rule. This is all equalities. When you write an inequality with mutual information, you have to be a bit more careful. But so far, all everything we wrote is equalities, so that's okay. All right. Now let's write an inequality. Uh, so this is something called the data processing inequality. Um, uh, and I mean, we'll write a more general version in a minute, but uh, for now, what we are saying is that suppose uh, you had uh, X and Y, and then you computed some function of Y. So that's uh, you process the data uh, corresponding to Y to get the processed information X uh, uh, G of Y. And this inequality says that because you process the information, you can only lose information about X or uh, kind of more formally, the mutual information of uh, uh, X, uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, X and G of Y is uh, no more than the mutual information of X and Y. So you can't process I and Y and kind of gain information about X. That's uh, roughly the content of the inequality. And uh, so G is, a function which depends only on y. It's not taking it from like any x into account. Okay. And the proof is really just sort of uh, going from the definition, but it's a, a useful one and we'll see it kind of generalizes in nice ways. Um, so let's write down the definition of um, the mutual information. It's um, uh, h of x uh, minus h of, uh, X given one, okay. uh, and in some sense, this is the interesting line in the proof where I will say that H of X given Y is the same as H of X given Y and G of Y. Okay. This is because Y, like G of Y is just a function of Y. So if you have specified a value for the random variable y, you've already automatically specified the value for g of y. Uh, so writing it in addition conditioning doesn't really change things. You can check this also, like write it out more formally and see. But the conditional distribution uh, conditioned on y and the distribution conditioned on y and g of y are the same distributions. And this is also something we saw last time in the Cauchy words. Maybe it was a bit rushed, but this was also discussed in the discussion section on Friday. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, and now we just sort of use the fact that uh, conditioning reduces entropy on average. So now instead of keeping Y and G of Y, let's just drop Y. Because we dropped this, the negative term can only increase, which means that the whole thing can only decrease. So we got uh, this quantity, which is nothing but the mutual information of X and G of Y. So that, that's pretty much it. It's not uh, more than that, but uh, um, it's a useful inequality and then we'll, as we'll see, it kind of also is a basis for some nice definitions. So any questions about this proof before we go ahead? Madhu, yes. I have a question Yes. on the previous page. Yeah. yeah. So when you say you, add Adding gy in mm -hmm. the conditioning doesn't change anything. It's mm -hmm. equal. Mm -hmm. Why it's uh why it's different when you drop y? Because if you given, I mean, when you given uh right, so you given, uh, both g and gy and y, I kind of think it can. It seems to me like they are kind of the same thing. So it's it doesn't matter to drop any one of them, but it doesn't seem the case. You only, it's only the same when you drop GY, but it, it's not yeah. the same when uh, you drop Y. Right, so, uh, I mean, I'll kind of give a more formal and a less formal answer, but kind of less formally, it's okay to uh, drop uh, G of Y, but not okay to drop Y because G of Y is a function of Y. So given the value of Y, G of Y is completely specified. On the other hand, the opposite is not true. So 
uh, given a g of y, y is not completely specified. The g of y could be a lossy function. It might only, let's say y is a string of uh, bits and g of y is only keeping the first three bits. So given g of y, like, sorry, given y, g of y is uniquely understood, but the other way is not true. Uh, and kind of more formally, uh, this is just uh, a shorthand for saying expectation. I mean, there are a couple of ways of formalizing it. But one, way, one way is saying that uh, we are looking at uh, h of x given uh, uh, y is equal to some number um, or some sort of particular value and uh, uh, g of y is equal to some other value. Let's, uh, let me just call it uh, little z. Now, if I didn't tell you that uh, g of y was equal to little z, it's not that you had any choice in the matter because uh, uh, the value of capital Y was given. So the value of uh, g of capital Y was also already known. So it's uh, this information here is redundant. On the other hand, if you consider this example where uh, uh, let's say y was a bit string um, uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, or uh, y prime was the string uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and let's say g of y was just a function which uh, sort of keeps the first three bits. So g of y is equal to g of y prime. Uh, but y is not equal to y prime. So if I just told you g of y, that's not the same as uh, telling you why the other way around is true. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. So now uh, we'll generalize this. Uh, and uh, kind of one generalization is the notion of what is called a Markov chain. So uh, it's just x, y, z are said to form a Markov chain where um, uh, X and Z are independent given Y. So if I tell you like the only dependence or the only way Z learns about X is through Y. It's sort of just the history that just came before it. This is a way of viewing this in terms of time. Notice that the way I defined it is actually reversible. It's just written this way, but um, you could have also written it the other way. Uh, it's just saying that X and Z are independent. Z and X are also independent given Y. It's the same thing. Uh, but it's just saying that the information kind of flows through Y, or this could be more generally what is called a Markov random field where you have, or like a Markov model, a graphical model, whatever you call it. There's like a bunch of variables. There's some sort of local ways in which depend, but for if for any variable, you kind of tell me it's neighborhood in some graph, then uh, it only depends on everything outside the outside world through its neighborhood in the graph. So this is more generally, and, and, the data processing inequality can also be just generalized. In fact, that is the more general version of the inequality is that if you go forward in this Markov chain, the mutual information can only go down. It can't go up. Okay. So, uh, and the previous example was where uh, Z was equal to G of Y, which uh, given Y is actually fixed. So it's of course independent of X, um, but uh, more generally you can say when, uh, you can also say this when, uh, it's just independent. The proof is actually the same as before. So let's write it down. Uh, so uh, we can write the mutual information as h of x minus h of x given y. Uh, what we would like to do, just like in the previous proof, is to say that um, h of x given y is equal to h of uh, x given y comma z. Uh, or rather the mutual information of um, uh, x and z uh, given y is equal to zero, which is true because they are independent uh, uh, given y. In particular, given every value of y, they are independent random variables. Independent random variables have zero mutual information. So, uh, so we can write exactly as before, we can include uh, Okay, 
notice that again like y and z are not the same thing y is in the middle so it's true that given y x and z are independent but it's not true that given z x and y are independent so that is why this is an inequality uh, okay so this is just the analog of the previous setting where given uh, g of y we couldn't recover y but more importantly we sort of it's not true that y and x are independent that's the minimum condition we need for this okay. there is an important example where that is the case and that's called a sufficient statistic so a function g which has this property that um, uh, given that's another way of defining it given g of y x and y are independent or rather the mutual information of x and y is equal to the mutual information of x and g of y is called a sufficient statistic of y for x okay so it carries all the information that you need with respect to x and it's a uh, it's, it's it's a function computed on y but really it sort of captures all that you really need to know about y uh, and there is also a notion of minimal sufficient statistic but right now we're just saying a sufficient statistic okay all right so that's the example where we the inequality we got would be an equality in, in the proof uh, and we could drop either uh, from the double condition Mm -hmm. and an example which i'd encourage you to try an exercise is suppose x was a, a probability it was either p1 or p2 okay. it equaled p1 with probability half t equal p2 with probability half given the value of x we can toss n coins each comes up heads with probability whatever is the value of x and comes up tails with the probability 1 minus whatever is the value of x so x is computed once or x is kind of uh, sampled once once we have this value of x we go and toss n independent coins and we get their outcomes and now we want to study what is the information about x in the sequence of coin tosses in the sequence y1 to yn okay and y is just a shorthand for the entire tuple uh and my claim is that all the information is just uh present in the count of the number of ones or the count of the number of heads if i tell you how many times this kind of y1 to yn turned up heads or came out one or what is the sum of them which is all these are equivalent ways of saying the same thing that's sufficient and i mean intuitively it makes sense because um, somehow that's the only seem like the only relevant thing uh, but it's a good exercise to try and prove it formally that the the sum of y1 to yn or the number of uh, heads is a sufficient statistic uh, of y for x where x is uh, trying to understand the probability whether it was p1 or p2 is the question clear i mean maybe the answer is also clear but if not i would recommend trying it it's a good thing to check all right um maybe we'll do fano's inequality next time we'll kind of um, close to the end of the lecture um uh yeah uh any questions if not let me just pontificate that sort of the this notion of sufficient statistic or in particular the notion of minimal sufficient statistic can also be relaxed to what is sometimes called the information bottleneck which people with maybe deep learning use uh, and so on but it's a sort of a similar idea that you want to see how much information does a function carry about a start uh, random variable um, uh and yeah we uh, won't discuss that too much in the class but if you read the paper it kind of makes a nice comparison with sufficient statistics and it's not uh, it's not too bad to read if you are curious okay any questions that you thought of uh, while i was rambling so i'm under what paper uh the the original one which i can define the information bottleneck uh, i mean i just kind of took a look at it uh, just to see what the definition was it, it's not too bad like like, like the information bottleneck and deep learning like the tishvi stuff i think when it was defined it was like pre deep learning right that was like 99 or 96 yeah. uh, uh so if i understood correctly it sort of just uh, stated as a as a generalization of what is called rate distortion which is um, how much information uh, can you preserve while uh, sort of um, uh, 
or like what what is the minimum mutual information you can have while not being too far away from a variable and slightly generalizing that stuff so it's purely information theoretic uh, and it, the contribution is that there is an algorithm to kind of compute uh, the right kind of y but um, uh, i think these days it's kind of applied in, in a deep learning although i don't properly understand sort of whether it when it makes sense to apply or when not uh, i just sort of looked at the mathematics and yeah mathematics wasn't too bad <laughs>